90.3 WHPC now presents Law You Should Know. The law affects every aspect of our lives, our home, our jobs, and our recreational activities. Now, learn about the law and how to protect yourself against the loss of your liberty or property and learn how to stand up for your rights and seek compensation when you have been wronged. Your host for Law You Should Know is attorney Kenneth J. Landau, a past dean of the Nassau Academy of Law and frequently lectures to lawyers on ethics and avoiding problems with clients and to the public on how to choose and use lawyers. This is Law You Should Know on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. Hi, this is Ken Landau, and welcome to Law You Should Know. Our guest is Deborah Ager, and she is a a writing and speaking and communications consultant and coach, both to lawyers and others. Deborah, welcome back to Law You Should Know. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here again. And today you were going to educate our lawyers and others who are listening about be less boring in their communications and their writing. And are we being bored to death by uh, news and articles and presentations out there? I think sometimes a a lot of people come to me and say that they worry about being boring in their own writing and in their own content. And to your point about news, I think that I have, I haven't done a scientific study, obviously, but I have heard people saying they just sort of get tired of the tone and even the topics that are being talked about in the news. And when it comes to, you know, law firms and businesses in general, I think having a clear message that is anti-boring is the way to go to be able to connect with your audience. And the people need that in the title, you know, should the title of the article, the video, their speech uh, be short, sweet, and a call to action? I think sometimes, I think short and sweet, it depends a little bit upon where they are engaging that audience and what kind of platform and how much space they have. But I think in terms of being anti-boring, what I encourage people to do is to understand their audience deeply, because when you deeply understand your audience and even empathize with them, then you're able to understand what will be interesting to them, because you'll be speaking to the needs that they have. Would you want to even expand it to make it to try to make your audience as broad as po- you know as possible? Yeah, that's a great question because there's a there's created an interesting title that is clickbait you know, gorilla found in the middle of the ocean or something like that. And people would say, what? And that would evoke curiosity. But then if they go to that website and it's really recipes for cheeseburgers, they're going to feel like they were tricked to get there. Well, you want to have truth, right? Yeah, yeah. So you always want it to be, I mean, I'm using a silly example just to make a point, obviously. But but yeah, so people want it to reflect the content that's there. And you definitely can change your title to appeal to more people and to make it more creative and to make it stand out more. But that headline is important because if it's, it could be the greatest article in the world, but if the headline doesn't attract people to it, and if the first paragraph doesn't attract people to it, it doesn't matter how great it is. Yeah, yeah, you're right. And going back to your news example, what I've noticed sometimes is that there will be a headline that doesn't, exa- it's true, but it doesn't exactly reflect the material that's being shared. And then what happens is the reader begins not to trust that source. So whether it's a newspaper or something else, they'll think, oh, okay, you got me that one time. And now I'm going to be more careful about what I click on to read from. And this- if you're trying to build a, a client relationship, an important consultancy and advisory relationship, you want to avoid that. Definitely. Yeah. You want, you want to, as, uh, as they say in the UK, you want it to do what it says on the tin. <laughs> but there are ways of presenting it. If it's wills and estates, it might be more important if it's phrased, you know, how to leave the money with your will, it's your way. So yeah, it creates exactly. urgency, uh, it creates something that's personal and important. Exactly. And to, your, to what you said, to build upon what you said about personal, personal storytelling and telling stories in general can be really beneficial to business. So one example, I helped a lawyer to talk about some of those topics that generally customers don't want to talk about. Clients don't want to talk about their wills. They don't want to talk about dying and those kinds of things. Even if they don't mind that, they might find the topic rather dry. So how do we make these things interesting so people actually take the actions that will benefit them? And one of the ways is through personal storytelling. So I worked with a lawyer to tell her personal story and journey of why her of why uh, of the path she took to be prepared so that when catastrophe befell her, then she was in a good position as possible to deal with it and come out of it on the other side in a healthy and financially secure way. 
And that's what lawyers and other financial professionals and uh, accountants you know, want to do. Yeah, exactly. exactly. And people don't want to feel they're being, you know, it's someone not trying to sell them something they don't need, but it's someone who's there to help them and, and maximize their circumstances. Yeah. And then tying back to what I said about empathy earlier, that when you share a story and your reader or your listener can understand that story, then they're better, you know, then they understand that you empathize with them and that you understand where they're coming from. Is it a matter of preventing problems or scaring people? Which do you think is the the better approach? That's a good point. I know that there are people who use fear tactics. I'm not a fan of them myself because it seems like that's not the relationship that I would want to establish with someone. I think you can lay out the facts in a clear way uh, through and still incorporate the interesting parts of story and the anti-boring elements of creating a story, but yet still not have to scare people into working with you. Beyond that, is it important, once you have the right message, is it important to be as less boring as possible in communicating your message and in the details of your message and the call to action of your message? I think so. If you can do something in a way that other people don't, it's going to help you stand out. One example I learned of was someone uh, who lives in a resort area and they're in charge of for that county, bringing new business into the county. And so on the website, it says, I won't use a person's real name, but it says the equivalent of, you know, call Deborah, at, you know, and then they have the phone number and they have, you know, that person did receive some phone calls. Now, someone else in a different county who works in tourism might have put, you know, click here for more information or, you know, click here to download a guide or, you know, see how you can participate or something like that. But this person put their phone number. So that really stands out because it's not what everyone else is doing. This isn't is that good anything. or bad? I mean, what if someone didn't want to talk to them? If someone didn't want to talk to that person? Some people might just like rather look at information on the internet. Yeah. The, the information is still there on the website for them to access, but if they wanted to take a next step by calling someone to talk to them, then that's there for them as an option. Or they can just read the information. Should they put the word free in there and stick to it? <laughs> I think no, people the, might wonder if it's going to be free, yeah. if it's going to be information. It's very important to be credible, especially if you're a lawyer. Oh, definitely. It's definitely important to have that and to be clear about it. I think free is a, is a popular word. So if it's true that it's free, then I would say that if you give a free consultation, um, that, that is a great thing to offer people. And they really appreciate having that. And if it's not free, you might, if it's true, you might want to say low cost because people, especially in dealing yeah. with lawyers or accountants or doctors or others, they're worried about, you know, a, a blank check. Exactly. There, in copywriting and content, there are power words and free is one of the power words. I'd say probably low or low price or low cost. That's another one because when people see low next to a price and they'll usually just think it seems lower and um, profitable is another one. There's, there's lots of power words that can be used in copy and content to help your content be anti-boring. And I like the word profit when it comes to saying profit from our experience because you're saying you have experience and you're going to use it to help them. You know, mm-hmm. They're going to profit from your experience as yeah. opposed to you being the profit, them being the profit center for you. Right. Should an article try to get a person to make a, you know, to, to buy a complicated uh, something big and pricey and complex, or it should just be the, to get them to call you to come see you for a consultation? What should you be trying to sell? That's a good point. It really depends upon your business and what it is you're trying to accomplish. And well, where let's you say you're a lawyer. Business. Yeah, yeah, no, but I mean, even lawyers have different specialties. So um, one thing, if you sell packages and you do a will and trust package, that's easy to price. And you could share your price on your website so people know. And if it's something that's a little bit more convoluted or it's going to be hard to tell how much it is, you can always say something like prices starting at just to give people a general idea of it. I feel like lawyers are have... For lawyers, I feel like people do expect that they're going to pay for that expertise a little bit more in that field than maybe other ones. So probably I'm guessing people don't call lawyers too often and say, well, actually, I don't need your help to create a will because I have no money like happens in other professions. Well, because of that, should the lawyer offer a free consultation or a low cost consultation to help people overcome that hurdle? I think that can be a great way to get people through the door and to establish relationships. So if if you have the time for it, I think it's great. And um, sometimes it makes sense to schedule how many you're going to do a week 
and make it a goal that you have for your new business development. Like I'm going to have eight phone calls a month, 10, four, whatever is the right number for you. And you also may offer that service as a loss leader because that may lead to probate of wills and estates. That may lead to real estate. That may be lead to litigation. That may lead to other more profitable services, just as an auto mechanic might offer the oil change as a loss leader because they want to do that tune up or that, you know, 60,000 mile servicing. That makes a lot of sense because once you begin establishing those relationships, then when people have something that pops up in their life where they need some help, they're going to turn to you first because you will have established that trust. And it's important to build that trust for um, for both sides. Exactly. And that may be why the accountant or the financial planner offers that free consultation. Yeah. I think it's important to note also that when you create anti-boring content that's educating people, that's encouraging them to take the next step, it makes your phone calls go better. So if you do end up offering a free initial consultation, that way you can spend more of the time at a higher level rather than answering the basic questions. You can point people to different areas of your website for content so that by the time they talk to you, they already have at least some of the basics covered and then you're not trying to start, you know, from the very beginning of the alphabet, so to speak. Or give them some free handouts when they come to your office, you know, once they're okay. there. That this right. is a checklist for wills. This is a information for the family to show you mean well, you're trying to help them, and you can offer that missing piece. Exactly. One of your credentials is you're a poet. I am. <laughs> can lawyers or others use poetry to sell their services or to use it as a marketing tool? Yeah, I think it's a really good point. Um, And you'll help them write the poem too. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. They can use their own poems or, you know, they'll know more about copyright than most people. But you can take snippets if you feel like it it relates to what you're offering. And I think that that is a way to stand out. You can also use quotes from past happy clients if you prefer to go that method. I think that's also really powerful to have that social proof on your website. Is it also good to come up with a slogan that helps show your credentials, helps describe the service you provide? Yeah, I think that's good. And that can tie into what your main message is. You can have, you know, one to three main messages that you want to get across to your customers. And then that ties into, it might tie into your tagline as well. Usually there's a relationship between those two areas. But when you identify what your what your unique message is based on what you offer, what you like to do and the ways you help people and the results you help them achieve, your messages can then become your content foundation and you can always draw from those to create new ideas for content. I just want to remind our listeners, you're listening to Law You Should Know. We're talking about how lawyers and other business people and others out there can be less boring and that why is that so important. Um, she has a firm called Radiant Media Labs. And as you've heard, she's a consultant and a writing consultant and a marketing consultant. Is it, is, is it important, to, you know, by lawyers and others being less boring, does it help bridge the gap, make it feel like people feel that you're approachable, that you'll give them information that they can understand and use, you know, rather than legalese or complicated uh, data and information? Data can be really useful to prove points, but the downside of it is that they're numbers and it doesn't really get into how people feel. So when I work with people, I I ask them to think about how their clients feel and what they think and say and so on so that they can really get a clear understanding of what's bothering them and what problems what problems they need to solve. And should lawyers keep it simple and to use simple language in their conversation, in their website, so that the client will understand what's going on and what options they have? Yeah, I think it's good to have someone review what you write and make sure that there's no legalese that that was able to sneak in there somehow. And then also thinking, running it through your own filter of, is this personable? Is this how I would talk to someone, you know, in person? You know, usually in person, we're not going to rattle off a lot of complicated terms people don't understand because we'll see from the expression on the listener's face that they have no idea what we're talking about. So I would run it through that kind of filter when you're talking with your clients and think, huh, if I was saying this out loud to someone, would they understand it? And that will help you write in a way that's clear and simple. And should you also give them some meat? Should it be 90% about you and how many plaques you have or (laughs) how you've helped people in situations, similar situations, how you have prevented people, you know, with resolving a little small legal matter to keep it from becoming a big or legal matter, how you took a difficult situation for that person or their family and resolved in a cost-effective manner? 
Exactly. That's I love stories for this this type of reason because you can weave in your expertise without it sounding braggy, and it allows people to put themselves in the role of the person that you are talking about. So, for instance, a really easy structure that someone could work with right now, so you can take this away as a tip, is to do what I call a case study story. And you would talk about where was your client before they came to you? What were they struggling with? What were they saying? What were the problems? Then what was the process like? Like, what was the first thing you did? Was it an initial consultation? Did they come to your office and you dove right into it right away? You know, what process did you take them through? And what was it like to have that experience of working with you? And then the third and final step is what was the result that they got? Did they, how did they feel? Did they feel more confident about their future? Did they feel more secure knowing that loose ends would be tied up? And what was the result? You know, did they, did it help them make a big real estate deal? Like how did it affect their life in a positive way? And just going toward that, it gave them peace of mind or it helped create great certainty, like through a will. It's about peace of mind. It's, a, it's about helping ensure that their wishes will be carry out at the appropriate time. So there's no uncertainty and the, you know, no one has to worry about all those things. It could be exactly. a business plan, a succession plan, some kind of contract. So there's a, a plan for taking care of a certain situation. Yeah, that makes people feel so much better to know that it's going to be that way. What are there some other pitfalls that you help lawyers and others avoid in their, their marketing strategy in the words that they use, in the way they describe scenarios, in the, the way they describe how they help people? I think sometimes people struggle with what to put on their about page. And because I kept hearing this so often, I created a free about page guide. Um, so it takes people through the process of figuring out what to put there. So it's a little bit more than a bio. Like if you put a bio, that's great, but it's probably what everybody else has. So what I suggest people do is to create a little bit of a story and then also find out a creative way to open up your page. So going back to that idea of maybe you'll open with a testimonial, maybe you'll open up with a quote that really means a lot to you from someone who you admire that relates into your work. And then you can tell the story of how you came to do this work. When you, when you tell the story of how you came to do the work, people really begin to resonate with you. They can read where you went to school and then those plaques that you talked about and then the awards. That's all fine to have woven in there. But it's really going to be that story and your reason for doing your work that's going to make people connect to you and make them reach out to you over somebody else who does something similar. You're also an expert at helping lawyers and others use LinkedIn. What content is, can, can people be uh, bored to death by LinkedIn? <laughs> How is it important to have a few things stand out? I think it's really important to get across a few a few types of content that help establish trust. So if we kind of boil down trust into, you know, what is it that makes up trust? A few of the things are credibility and reliability and then some other things too. And how can our content make that happen? So, you know, post on a regular basis. It doesn't have to be every day, but post on a regular basis. And then how do you establish credibility? You share those stories, like the case study story I talked about. You can share your perceptions and your knowledge. And even sometimes if you want some how-to content, you can also do some interviews with other people. Maybe you can't do interviews with client due to confidentiality, but maybe with another lawyer in your space or, you know, maybe with someone who's got an area of expertise who could, um, who would have information that's of use to your clientele. You offer a lot of how-to content on your, your website and your social media. Is it important for lawyers or others offer a lot of how-to or a lot of information on their sites and in their social media? I, for me, I, I offer some tips that kind of give people an idea about things they can do right away to help improve their writing. And I think it's fine to do that. What I, what I, what I personally don't do is I don't go into a long, you know, explanations of how to do things because people aren't really looking for that and they kind of get lost in all the information. And the bottom line is with a lawyer, especially people really need lawyers. So people really, you know, when you're working with a service professional, people are going to need you and they're not going to be able to do it on their own, but they might think they can start to do some things on their own and then kind of get lost if we give them how-to information that's too long. We might want to give them a little information about what you do. You want to show how you've helped people solve problems or, or prevent problems. And a lawyer, most people don't think of lawyers as a problem solver or a problem preventer. They probably think of them with a lot of words we can't use on the air, but if they change the, the, if they reframe it, they might think they're like a doctor or like uh, there's someone helping them to, to 
be in a better place or a better situation. Exactly. Exactly. And I think it's even possible. I know this might feel uncomfortable for people to hear, but I do think it's possible for people to even tie in their interests into what they're doing. There was one lawyer who tied in her interest in yoga and then talked about law, uh, talked about law in a really interesting way. And she really stood out, but it really worked for her market. So obviously, you know, anything you do would have to work for your particular target market. And um, but anyway, so it's just something to keep in mind. Anytime lawyers are caught doing something good or performing consumer consumers, you know, community service is probably a good day for the legal profession. Yeah. Anything else you would offer about being anti-boring for, for lawyers and other professionals in their marketing and writing? The first thing is know your audience inside and out and think about what they feel and do before they come on to work with you so you understand how they're thinking about it. And the second is that... If you're writing, if you choose to write a story, like I suggested, just, um, you know, just keep in mind that you were trained to write a certain way. And so sometimes when you are trained to write a certain way in law school, it can be difficult to completely give that up and write in a different way. So just be nice to yourself if that if that feels somewhat challenging. And sometimes you're writing for different audiences. If you're writing to the courts, you're writing to other lawyers that may be different than writing to clients or prospective customers or marketing messages. And they may work against each other, and you can probably help them with those marketing messages. Exactly, yes. Any other thoughts? And with emails, it's you. It's a good to keep everything short and, and you know, just give the tip of the iceberg and the headlines out there and, and maybe some talking points. Yeah, I think emails, um, getting to the point is always nice. Sometimes people feel like they need a lot of flowery language inside an email. Other people just, you know, write a few words, and that might seem a little bit curt. But I think that you know, being really clear about what step you want people to take next is important. And I kind of look at it, I use the metaphor of a ship, but first we're going to chart the course and just figure out what are we trying to do with this email. Then we're going to kind of scan the horizon and see what people need to know. And then we're going to dock the ship at the very end, which is basically making sure you're clear on what step you want the person to take. Do they need to call you? Do they need to email you? Do they need to go read something? Just Can it offer things. them different options too? Depending applies, on what they're comfortable yeah. with? Yeah, if it applies to your situation, yeah. Are some some websites too fancy? They take too much time to download. They take too much time for people to search through them, for people to react to them. Yeah, some websites have a lot of bells and whistles that make them run slowly, and that's a challenge because the Google, you know, Google doesn't like that, and it will rank your page lower than websites that load more quickly. So it's always good to work with someone who can optimize that for you and and make your page load faster. Sometimes it's better to keep it short and simple. Exactly. Any other final thoughts you have on, on how lawyers can be less boring? And tell us about your books and your workshops out there. Sure. So I have a monthly roundtable that's free, so people can feel welcome to come to that. I call it a web copy roundtable. Every month we address a different kind of topic. So um, feel free to come. I also, if you're looking to sort of if you're looking to add some spark to your website, I have a free about page guide that takes you through how to create your own about page. And you could probably look at their website and tell them that you can find five, 10, 15, a hundred ways to make it more interesting. Exactly. And you can probably challenge them. If they, you can't find a way, get, way to make it better, you'll get them a cup of coffee or something. <laughs> Just give us the email and how people can reach you. Sure. You can go to my website, which is radiantmedialabs.com. And you can feel free to email me at deborah at radiantmedialabs.com. My name is spelled D-E-B-O-R-A-H. What are your other tips for help lawyers and others to be less boring? Yeah, I think also you can think about what language you want to be using. So are there certain words that you want associated with your brand? Uh, It's also important to think about how you want to sound. Do you want to be the fun lawyer, the personable lawyer? Do you want to be elegant? Do you want to be straight to the point and kind of harsh for some reason? Uh, You you know, figure out what your tone is and then make sure that you're conveying that tone in all of your written communications. What's kind of strange sometimes is when people uh, see you as one way, online and then they meet you in person and if you're totally different and it's a little bit it's a little distracting to people and people don't always react to that very well is it good for lawyers and all of us to express concern for how people are doing you know how they're surviving covid covid or the business climate yeah i think that's really i think it is really valuable i think the best service providers are ones who think through what their clients need even if 
they, the service provider, can't directly benefit. So one example I heard recently, a real estate agent was working with her clients to help them get prepared to buy a house. She's like, I know they can't use me right now because they need to do some initial steps first. She would counsel them through those steps. And she kind of went for the long game as opposed to thinking only about the short sale. And they would come back to her later and say, hey, I'm ready now. It might be six months or a year later. But she was helping them get prepared and serving them before she could even financially benefit from them. And that and that reaching out and educating people is also good about collaborate collaboration between different specialties because it might be things a, a person has to do to buy or sell a house. And a real estate firm has a piece of it. They could educate the clients and a real estate broker would have a piece of it and can educate the clients. Yeah, there is so much there's so much possibility for cross expertise collaboration that really it's endless what you can do. What about on trying to get free publicity? People, you know, there's still a newspapers out there. You want to be quoted on other websites. You want mm-hmm. people to carry you on, on other websites. And we talked about the brokers versus the lawyers. How can you cross-publicize your resources and information? Bring it to the attention of others. Yeah, I think that you can think through, you know, what kinds of events do you have coming up or what are you offering in the community? Are you doing something in particular? So sometimes I've seen where locally based companies will do that through service to the community and they might it, it either might be them or their staff that is doing something in the community and they they can uh, pitch that as an idea to a local newspaper. So that's one way to do to go about that. And people are looking for information. So just on the the broker you mentioned, the lawyer I mentioned, they can put a little how-to, a little tip sheet on their website, a little video, Mm -hmm. a simple video on their their website about before and after or pitfalls and, and how clients can avoid certain pitfalls of buying and selling real estate. I think video is a powerful medium and having some video on your website helps break the ice with people and makes them feel more comfortable with you. So one, and it's really great for people who might be tired of writing or don't really love to write to be able to create a video and put it on their blog with some notes. It's an easy way to get out there and get in front of people. And there should be something with, aside from a talking head in the video, uh, you know, some kind of example, a picture, talking points. You could do it a couple different ways. There's a tool called Loom you can use where your head is down in the corner and then you can show a screen like to show a presentation or to show maybe information on a PDF. You can also, if you, if you use your own, you know, yourself to keep from looking like just a head on a screen, you can just sit back from the, the video camera a little bit and make sure your background is uncluttered and then just use that. Sometimes that can be really good because people can see you up close and personal in a way, and that makes it almost, it's not really quite the same, but it makes them feel like they could be sitting across from you. And whatever way people go, you can help them to be less boring doing it. Exactly, yeah. I okay, can. I'd like to thank our guest, and you can reach her at Deborah at radiantmedialabs.com. If you missed any part of today's program or you want to tell someone else about it, The podcast is at nccradio.org, along with many other podcasts about law and law-related issues and other programs from here on 90.3 WHBC. And you're listening to us on 90.3 FM WHBC, the voice of NASA Community College in Garden City, New York. Please join us next week at this same time for another program of Law You Should Know.